pleasure to be back here with uh, the fourth in a series of Africa Business School learning. And today we're on the marketing track and we're going to talk a little bit about CRM, what it is and how it works. As I said, it's a series of sessions that we have within the marketing uh, track, the Parcours Marketing. We're on number four, the two more to follow. And uh, very happy to see some of the same names and some new names as well that are participating today. So let's get started. What are we going to do today? Well, we're going to talk about putting the customer in the middle of your business. It's called customer centric culture. And CRM is a big part of it and actually facilitates it. We'll be talking a lot about CRM, what it means. I'll try several definitions on you and hopefully in about 25 minutes from now, we'll have a better understanding of what CRM does for a company and the benefits. Along the way, we will visit what they call the customer journey. So how does a customer experience doing business with us? How does a customer see our company, our people? And what kind of experiences does a customer have along the way, the customer journey? Then we'll circle back and say, okay, you know, CRM and similar systems, very often we think about large companies that invest a lot of money in software and systems, and maybe it's not so much for the small companies. Well, that's not really true. It's for all companies. Uh, almost, it, it doesn't matter how big or small a company is. There is a CRM uh, type of software and functionality for every size company. And we'll look at six reasons why it's always good to use CRM. You know, how it benefits your business. And then we'll end with a conclusion. So to answer the first question, what is CRM really? Well, it stands as most of you I'm sure will know for customer relationship management. So it's about managing all the contacts, all the interactions that you have with customers and prospective customers, people that you would like to become your customers. So all the uh, activity that deals with people that you want to become part of your business, that you want to connect with. They have a relationship with you. Sometimes it's a beginning relationship, sometimes it's a long time relationship that is, uh, dates back 20, 30 years. And along the way, you pick up a lot of information about your customers, you know a lot. The problem often is though, that a lot of this information is in people's heads. It depends who talks to the customer, who interacts with the customer. And that's where it stays. So it's not easy to share and it's almost impossible for people to see, for other people to see. So it never really comes together. So you run the risk of sending someone to a customer to do something and the customer says, oh, yesterday I had a service technician here and we had this problem. And you're, you're surprised because you didn't know. And if the service technician would have had a tool to enter that information into a database that everybody could see, then before going to the customer, you could have just clicked on the name and you would have seen it. So it's all about information. It's about data. It's about data-driven sales and how that benefits your business. In the process, you put the customer at the heart of your organization. Everybody deals with the customer. All functions in the company deal with the customer and they can actually see the customer. So that's where the word customer centricity comes from. Everybody sees the customer, everybody works for the customer, everybody co-owns the customer, feels responsible for how the customer perceives your business, and everybody is responsible for delighting the customer. And it doesn't really matter who they are and, and where they sit in the company. It's not just the salespeople, it's not just the marketing people, it's really everyone. It starts with senior management, uh, it has to do with the people that design the product. Of course, they need to understand the customer, what the customer wants. It has to do with giving the information to the people that deal with the customer on a daily basis, the salespeople, empowering them. It's also about metrics. If you start collecting data, you can actually start measuring things. And you can measure trends and you can see if you're improving or not improving, if customers happy or not happy. So all kinds of data translate into very actionable information that helps you manage the business. Feedback drives continuous improvement. So if I wanted to summarize this in one long sentence, it would look a little bit like this. 
It's an up-to-date, so it's always current, up-to-date repository of everything anyone in your business knows about current or prospective customers. And it's all stored, analyzed, and accessible in a central repository. The central repository has real-time reporting. It's not a monthly report. It's not a weekly report. No, what, whenever we add data, you can update the reports. Real-time reporting that's distributed on what they call a need-to-know basis. Whenever we start collecting data and analyzing and reporting, there's a bit of a risk, and the risk is called overload. If you give people too, too much data, too many pieces of information, then they forget to look at what's really critical to their function. So it's very important that you make information available to people on what they call an as-needed basis. The salesperson needs specific information to do his or her job right. The CEO of the company needs specific information, but it's not the same, but it comes from the same database. So the same database allows to extract different reports, different information for different people in the organization that they need to do their job well. A slightly more formal definition that I'm going to try on you uh, also deals with the process side of it. CRM is a cross-functional process, and I underlined cross-functional because everybody, and I'll repeat it several times, everybody in the company owns a piece of CRM across all the functions, whether it's sales, marketing, finance, production, uh, leadership, it doesn't matter. They all own a piece of CRM because that's where they take information and that's where they give information because the data comes from all the people that touch the customer. And you may be wondering why finance, for example. Well, finance does the invoicing to customers. You have customers that pay very well on a timely manner and you have customers that maybe do not pay well. That's, that's important information. It needs to be visible. For example, that needs to be visible to the salesperson. You don't want to go and sell more to a customer that still has open bills that were unpaid since a long time uh, and in increases credit. So that's the finance part of it. I already explained the, the design engineering, the production people that need to know what product features the customers value and are looking for. So all the information goes from CRM. So cross-functional. It generates a flow of customer information that if well analyzed, which is a, a big condition, well analyzed can influence literally every aspect of the business. And it can improve all the things that I listed, that I listed below. Customer retention, the ability to keep customers connected with you, not just the one deal, but make them come back, feed the loyalty. And with a little bit of luck, actually create customer advocacy. They start talking positively about you to others the customers. Product design, I already mentioned that a couple of times. It's marketing effectiveness. I know who my customers are, where they are, what they have, what they do, what they want, what they need. It's all vital information for effective marketing, for creating effective marketing campaigns, for special offers, new product design, product launches. You know exactly who they are, where they are, how to contact them. You have all that information and it's current. So for the marketing function, it's a lifeline. Without a good, a well-functioning CRM, marketing cannot really do their job very effectively. And the same holds true for sales. If I go to a customer and I know nothing about this customer, I'm going to waste a lot of my time, but also his time to find out what they need, what they have, uh, the background, the business process. And the only reason might be that we, we had that information, we just never shared it. That's why CRM Customer relationship management is a good thing to have. Because of the marketing effectiveness, the sales effectiveness, of course, my market share may go up. My SOW share of wallets, the amount of business that I get from one customer may also increase. As I get to know the customer better, I may discover more business opportunities with the same customer. It will allow me to segment customers on all kinds of criteria. Give me all the customers in a uh, 10 kilometer radius around Marrakesh. My CRM will be able to do that for me. Give me all the customers in the last five years bought this product, my CRM will do this for me. So all this information becomes available and if you learn how to use it, it becomes very valuable, of course. It'll help my customer journey. How 
because customers will feel that I'm making an effort to actually give them what they really need, that I'm making an effort to get to know them and to not keep asking the same questions and to serve them exactly at the right time with the right services and the right product. So that will affect my brand image as a very professional company. The customer will see us as a company that understands his or her needs. I save the best for last, predictive capability. Because over time, when you start collecting and analyzing data in a consistent manner, the system will detect trends. The best predictor of the future in many cases is the past. So if you have well documented and analyzed the data up to a certain point in time, just extending the trend lines will give you a pretty good view of the future. And the predictive capability of CRM is very, very valuable uh, for all kinds of planning, production planning, marketing planning, sales targets, profitability planning, yeah, everything you need to do, all the metrics you have, uh, have some element of predictive capability as you go into the next business cycle. So critical importance here and very well served by CRM, which in most cases, of course, is software supported. CRM is the process. And to serve that process, to operate that process, there are probably over a thousand different CRM types of software. Very complex, very simple, and everything in between. Very expensive, very inexpensive, and everything in between. You just need to pick the right one for your business, for your type of business, and for your size. Prior to CRM, people used to do their own spreadsheets and try to create something similar, but of course it was very basic, very crude. As we interact with customers and, and we want to collect that information, we need to have a very, very good understanding of the road that the customer travels when they interact with us, when they do business with us. And there's a starting point, which is the first time that they become aware of our existence, of our products. And there's an end point, which is not the sale. The sale actually, as you see here, sits in the middle, the purchase. In fact, with the, with the, with, with the real uh, promising customer, I don't want there to be a finish point. I want this road to be never ending. I want this road to go back and connect and go through a similar process for the next purchase. So after the purchase, I work to retain customer called retention. And I want to get it to a point that the customer talks positively about me, advocacy. So how much do we know about this? I thought I'd, I'd take a few minutes to talk about the concept of customer journey mapping. For a couple of reasons. This is where a lot of the, the data come from. Uh, but I, I'd also like to demonstrate the value of doing it purely from a business perspective. If, if, if you look at this representation, it starts with awareness. There is a point in time that the customer be, becomes aware of you. Can be reading about it, can be a newspaper, can be television, can be a friend, yeah, whatever that is, but there's a point. Now, is that point, is that a positive experience? Then you will see the bubble above the line. Positive experience. The dotted line in the middle is neutral. If you're on the neutral line, it's not positive, it's not negative. If the experience at that point is negative, then it's below the line. So you have product awareness and we have categorized five major uh, areas here, awareness, consideration, purchase, retention, and advocacy. You can create a customer map for any business at any time and you can make it look different depending on the number of touch points that you have with the customer. You can plot the points as you like, as it's relevant for your business. At the, at the, at the higher level, you can uh, detect those categories, define those categories, say, okay, the first time the customer finds out, then the customer is going to consider whether you are a viable supplier to him, a viable vendor. So the customer does research very often, by the way, on the internet. Then if you have a store, they may come to your place of business, your shop, your showroom, or whatever it is. So there's a store visit. Hopefully that will then uh, result in a purchase. So the customer now buys from you. The customer will receive the product, depending on what it is. It can be very simple. It can be a bit more complex. Maybe it needs to be put together. Maybe it needs to be commissioned. So, you know, it, it, it can have different shapes and forms. 
then after starting using it, there may be an issue with the product. So how's your after sales service to that same customer? And if that's not good, how does this customer behave on social media? Does it result in a social media complaint, what we have here in this case? So there are a couple of things that we can learn from this. First of all, apparently the first couple of stages we do pretty well. We have good product awareness. If the customer looks around, compares us, we come out pretty, pretty good, it's positive. The store visit is okay. You know, it's not a wow experience, but it's not objectionable. We're just above the neutral line. Product purchase, great, friendly people, everything smooth. Product receipt, receipt, great, no problem. Then something goes wrong with the product. And the customer tries to come back and get it fixed or get help. Well, it turns negative. And it turns so negative that the customer puts a social complaint on one of the social platforms. They talk about you, but not in a positive way. They talk about you in a negative way, which can be incredibly damaging. And the countless examples. So as a business, I look at this. And of course, I don't want this. I don't want the, the, the experience of the customer to be inconsistent. But to manage it, I need to have all that information. So that's why in some companies, you actually now have what they call a customer experience manager, which is a cross-functional job that looks at all these touch points and makes sure that they are consistent, that the customer has a consistently good experience. Because if it ends on a social complaint like this, if that's the last touch point we have with the customer, that road is not gonna come back. He's not gonna come back to the start and do it again. The, the most recent experience typically sticks and determines the behavior of the company. Now you can do an interesting thing with the, with the customer journey. Uh, just for a bit of fun here, because the, it's too nice of an opportunity to let it go. You can, of course, on that same graph, also plot your number one competitor. How do you compare to your number one competitor? The black dots on this chart are your number one competitor. And you rate them on the same experiences that you measured for your own customer. And sometimes this is you know, what the customer tells you, or you may know the, the, the competitor yourself in the place of business. So doing this actually helps you compare yourself from a customer perspective to your number one competitor. You can also plot your number two, your number three, whatever you want to do with this. So whenever my circle has a green one around it, I'm better than my competitors. So I'm good. But on those points where it's red, my competitor is better than me, which means that I, I, I'm running a risk. That's a point, that's a customer experience where I may lose my customer because the competition is better. And it gets very specific because in this case, the first time that it happens is a store visit. And the customer is not terribly impressed with my store, but he's very impressed with the competitive store. I may lose him at that point. Product issue and response, if there's a problem, the competitor is much better, leaves a positive impression. I, although I'm better on product purchase and product receipt, that's where I lose it. And on the social complaint, I lose it even more because they speak positively about my competitor and they speak negatively about me. They call this a gap chart. It shows the gaps between the difference between you and your nearest competitor. Okay, back to data, back to CRM. Data has really become a, a, the number one strategic resource. If you want to be successful in business today, without information, without data, chances are you're not going to be very successful or you may be not successful at all. So you need to have data collection, data analysis, data reporting, and the predictive capability because it is your number one resource. Those who have information win. That's interesting because you would think, my God, with all, this, with all this background, every company surely has a CRM, right? No, that's not the case. Today, just over 50% of companies have some kind of CRM system, which is good and bad. Uh, of course, it's, it's good for the ones that already have it because they are likely better performers. It's bad for the ones that don't but the good part there is that they have huge opportunity if they make the switch. And one of the reasons 
that some of them don't have it, that there's always been this belief that CRM is more for large companies than for small companies. Because it costs money, it takes time, it takes people, and we, you know, we're just a small company. We only have 10 people, we only have 15 people or whatever. And interestingly, in fact, I picked this up this morning from the internet, the Small and Medium Business Trends Report. Uh, it's been published by Salesforce. Salesforce is one of the leading CRM software suppliers. And in the comments they offer, they say that the corona impact, and who cannot talk about corona at this time? The corona impact shows a very significant interest among small and medium-sized businesses. They are discovering the value of data. If you can't go out all the time and visit your customer and talk to your customer, where do you get your information? Where do you keep it? How do you keep in touch? How do you keep in touch in a meaningful way? And they're discovering CRM. So they're seeing a big increase in interest and for sure that percentage of 50% will go up over the next few months because the general expectation is that a lot of uh, the business practice that were, f that were forced to learn during these corona times is going to continue. Uh, so a lot of stuff will continue to go online and stay online as we go further from where we are today. So just remember from this lesson that CRM is for everyone, for all sizes, not just the big companies. Why not? Well, here are six good reasons why CRM is good for all size companies. First of all, you manage all information in one place. I don't have to elaborate. I've already mentioned it several times, what, how beneficial that is. You develop a deep understanding database knowledge of your customer, which of course is very, very beneficial for all the functions that deal with the customer. You automate, we didn't talk about this very much, but you have repetitive tasks that you can automate and use CRM as a repository for the tools that you give to your salespeople, to your marketing people, to your service people. For example, a salesperson from time to time has to write a quotation to a customer, an offer. It is very important that that's done correctly, that is legally correct, that it doesn't expose the company to uh, risks that, that shouldn't be there. So what better way to actually pre-write that quote so that the salesperson only has to fill in the product and the price and the delivery and the rest is already there. So it's always the same consistency, consistent level. It makes a good impression on the customer as well. Marketing teams, I mentioned, have a wealth of information that comes from CRM. Sales teams have a wealth of information that comes from CRM. And of course, the service teams as well. And let's not forget the number seven reason why customer, why customer relationship management is important. Customers benefit from it. You, you deal with them on a more professional level, on a more informed level. Imagine going to a doctor and every time, and it's your doctor, and every time you show up at his office, okay, what's your name again? And did you have any problems in the past? Did, did I see you before? And you've already been there 25 times. Guess what? The doctor actually has a CRM. The doctor has a file that has all your information and all your history. And if it's a really good doctor and you have an appointment with him, he has looked up that information before you show up for your appointment. And you will think, wow, this guy's interested in me. He knows me. He knows my background. And maybe he just read it 10 minutes before you came, that's okay, but he made the effort. So customers benefit from this. It also helps to develop a real customer culture in your company. Now, if it's so beneficial and it does so many things for you, why is it difficult to do? Or is it? And if you, if you talk to companies that tried this, and very often it's part of what they call digital transformation process, CRM can be a big component in this. It fails sometimes, it just doesn't work well. They get some people interested, they get some people to go along, but not the whole company. It doesn't get to the point that it becomes part of the culture. So what are some of the things that get in the way of this? First of all, everybody needs to commit. That, need, that means that you need to communicate with everybody and that you have clear leadership support and advocacy. We want this and explanation. You know, we want this because, and show people that there's something in it for them. There are benefits that we don't have today that we will all have tomorrow. 
will be a more successful company. We can hire more people. We can make more investments. You know, everything, but you need to explain it. Because if you don't, the fear of the unknown will create pushback. People want to stay in the comfort zone. I've always done it this way. Why would I change? Well, you need to have a good answer to that question to overcome that resistance to change. But change management is important. In conclusion, well, I said change management is important. What you see here on the left is a typical trunk of a car of a salesperson 40, 50 years ago. The best salespeople had the best organized trunk with literature, with reference books, with notes, with everything. And I've actually, uh, I've seen it myself. I've seen the end of that era, that salespeople. Now, if it's in the trunk of a salesperson, it's nowhere else. Nobody else can see it. Nobody else can use it. Nobody else can do anything with it. And it's not the most accessible place for information to be, as you can tell. Today, we have CRM. It's technology. It's digital. It plays on any device you have, smartphone, tablet, desktop, doesn't matter. And it gives a view of the customer for everyone in the company. It's been researched by A.T. Kearney, a consulting company, and they found that companies that embrace the technology and make CRM part of their uh, DNA, they show more than double the sales growth of companies that do not. So if you're looking for compelling arguments, that's where it is. Because the companies that do not embrace technology simply will not survive. And the reason is that others do and they don't. So on a positive note, I mentioned one new job that comes from this. Sometimes we're scared of technology because we think it takes job. Well, technology also adds jobs. I, I listed some jobs here that came up in the last five to 10 years. They didn't exist before. We didn't have a CRM manager. We didn't have a data analyst on the sales team. We didn't have a data manager on the sales team. We didn't have a customer happiness manager. We didn't have a customer experience coordinator or customer experience, manager. all new jobs. And if you look around, you see them everywhere. The customer happiness manager comes from Amazon. I just read about it a couple of days ago. Uh, they have customer happiness uh, representatives or customer experience representatives. So they monitor everything and they want to know exactly what happens. The best in class sales organizations have three times more sales staff with analytical and statistical skills than companies that do not embrace this. So there are good new jobs out there, very interesting ones. And the, 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 the companies that go looking for those people typically do much better. So with this, we're 30 minutes on the dot. I'll gladly open it up for questions. I have a few here from Gita. Let me go to my WhatsApp. Okay, the first question. Can the SLA service level agreement be useful for CRM? Absolutely. Uh, first of all, the service level agreement puts people on site on a regular basis. So it becomes a source of data collection. Uh, and at the same time, uh, what you actually do, the interactions that, the, that you have with the customer, the interventions that you have with the customer, get stored in CRM. So yeah, it's, it's certainly useful. Uh, with and without CRM, of course, a service level agreement is a useful thing to have always, to be in good contact with your customers. And, work on that retention process. How can CRM accompany customer success strategy? That's a bit of a philosophical uh, question, of course. Our objective as a company always has to be to make our customers successful. Because if the customer is not successful, we may get part of the blame if we sold them the wrong product. Uh, or if the customer goes out of business, we lose a customer. So. We want our customers to be successful and we want to be part of it and we want customers to feel that we contribute to their success. So the more informed, the more equipped the people are that I send to that customer to interact with the customer, the better the chances are to help make that company successful. 
So CRM, I would say, is almost essential. The worst thing you can do is send someone to a customer. Imagine you've been a customer for 10 years somewhere and the, your supplier just hired a new salesman and he comes to you for the first time and he knows nothing about you. Doesn't have any history, doesn't know the people that work there, doesn't know what you purchased, what you used. What... You start from scratch. You lose 10 years of knowledge and 10 years of data. So yeah, I think it's, it's a big factor. CRM failure, the main reasons, uh, I'll give you the number one reason first. The number one reason is people underestimate the complexity of implementation of technology. Some people think you just buy the software, you install it and you're fine. Well, that never works. In fact, nine out of 10 software installations, not only CRM, that are done that way fail because people don't, people don't commit to them. They don't understand why, they don't see the benefits and they don't want to do it. So lack of change management is, is a big factor in CRM failure. Uh, of course, sometimes they also buy the wrong software. They buy something very complex for a simple uh, situation or they buy something simple for a far more complex situation. But I would say people is the biggest challenge. Get the people to support it and make it work. E even if the system is not perfect, people can make it work. But if people are not motivated to do it, you're without a chance, even if you have the best possible system or software. Can you give us an example for a good CRM? Uh, there are several. If you just Google CRM, then you'll see many of them. I don't have a particular preference. I'm more familiar, I'm more familiar with some than others. I know salesforce.com, which is one of the better known ones, one of the leading suppliers. And I think that, that they're pretty good. There's another one called sugar.com. There's a whole list of, and some of the big players have customer relationship modules. Uh, as, as part of their business system. Uh, so whatever uh, business operating system you have, uh, chances are that if it's one of the better known ones, you will find modules that will serve CRM. So many, many opportunities, and it, it really depends on your type of business, which one uh, fits best for you. Uh, let's see how and to what extent can CRM add value to the enterprise? Well, we, I think this one came probably before we got to the end of the presentation. Uh, companies that embrace CRM and related technology uh, have a sales growth that, that outpaces their, their, their competitors by a factor two or more. So it's really about business results. CRM gives you better results, it's that simple. Bottom line results. Uh, can CRM be a catalyst to change? Oh, that's a really nice question. Yes, CRM drives change. CRM helps put the customer in the middle of your company. Because now all of a sudden, people own a piece of the customer relationship. They're responsible for it. They get their reports from it. They need to feed it. And the customer becomes real for them. In the old days, customers, that was the domain of the salespeople. Nobody else saw them. Nobody else knew them. Either. Today. It really helps create a customer culture uh, that, that, that helps the visibility and the commitment in the company. So yeah, it, it uh, can be a real catalyst to change. It also, if we have time, I'll just spend one minute on this. Historically, in business to business, salespeople, if they have 100% of the time available, on the average, only spend 25% of their time face to face with customers, which is their actual job. They're B2B salespeople, they're supposed to be interacting with customers. They only do that 25% of the time. What do they do the other 75%? Well, they travel, they make phone calls, they write emails, they write reports, they prepare for sales calls, they look for information, all kinds of stuff that's not value added from a customer perspective. It's just stuff, it's administrative burden. You start using CRM, the sales effectiveness, the time that the salesperson can spend actually interacting with the customer increases dramatically. And instead of only spending 25% with the customer, all of a sudden you see them spending 60, 70% of the time with the customer. So you have just doubled your sales effort by, by investing in CRM, not by adding people. It's the same people, they just have more time 
can do more value added work. So yeah, big impact of, of, of CRM. And it changes the culture as well. Uh, because you have older salespeople that may find it a bit more difficult. So you have to really work to, to show the benefits of, of adopting this. Um, among data collected in CRM, can we also use data about customer profile during contract negotiation? Of course. Uh, see no reason why, why, why not. Uh, but as always, you need to be sensitive, of course, to what a customer would consider private or confidential, uh, something that the customer would not want to see on, a, on the table when you negotiate. So be careful, but in principle, there's no reason not to. Um, could CRM be applied to schools and universities? Absolutely. Absolutely, because schools and universities have customers. Now, some people don't like to hear this, but it's a reality that most schools and universities have a sales function, have a market function, and they need to attract customers. Their customers, well, if you would not agree that the students are the customers, at the very least, in many cases, you should agree that their parents are the customers because they send their kids. I mean, there's someone somewhere who pays for the education. So you have paying customers and the customer experience is for the most part how the students perceive you. Imagine the impact if all the students that come to your school and stay there for a while and go back into the real world, say, well, this school, I wouldn't send my, uh, my children there or I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't send, uh, I wouldn't recommend it to my best friend or uh, other relatives or, you know, it's devastating. So you need to treat them as customers and be mindful of the student experience. And I think there's a high level of commonality between the student experience and the customer experience, no doubt. So yeah, it's a good question. And let me see what else we have here. Uh, is there a difference between customer happiness manager and a customer experience manager? Not really. I, you know, some companies like uh, funny or, or uh, creative job titles. Um, I would say customer happiness is a bit more directive. It tells you what the outcome of the job should be, customer happiness. Customer experience is more of a data research connotation. I'm a customer experience manager. It doesn't tell me whether you want that to be a negative or a positive or anything. It just says customer experience. So yeah, it, 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 it could be the same job, but the one title adds a bit more, I think, in terms of being uh, reflective of the outcome that you want to see. Uh, in which phase of strategy development is it important to think about setting up CRM? I would say right now. I don't really care too much which stage of strategy development you are. It's independent of your strategy development. The sooner you can do it, the better it is. Your strategy development process will benefit from it. So don't hesitate. Don't do your strategy first and then buy the CRM to find out that maybe you missed a few things in your strategy. Think of the predictive capability that I mentioned. What a wonderful tool that is if you plan your strategy. In an environment like Alibaba for B2B business, which I believe is more transactional rather than relational, do you think the conventional customer relationship process might evolve? Yes, it will evolve. Of course, the types of interactions that Alibaba has or Amazon has is different than the types of interactions that you have in a in a face to face in person situation. Um, but the principles apply, and companies like Alibaba and Amazon they practice very, very rigorous customer research, not only to see if they're happy, to also see if they can sell more. So they're very, very clever in following your, your buying patterns. They, they know what you're interested in. They know where you live. They know, in many cases, how old you are, male, female, married, not married. All this uh, machine intelligence is applied to all the data they collect on an ongoing basis. Then all of a sudden you get you get a you get a an email, say hey you know we have this product we think you might be interested and in many cases it is something you're interested in because they know you and they know more about you than anything else, so it it changes the the, the dynamics of course and it, it it's it's all systems and machine based, and there's a lot of AI coming in, in coming into this, 
but it, it's it's the trend. It's interesting that we all buy from Alibaba and Amazon. We've never seen a salesperson that works at Alibaba or Amazon. Um, we we uh, we book uh, taxi rides from Uber. We've never seen anyone who works for Uber other than the driver. Um, you know, you can list a long list. We book hotels from Booking.com. They own they don't own a single hotel in the world. They're just an information broker. That's why I said information is strategic resource today. Booking.com makes money on data, nothing else. They just have the data. And the data, having them, gives them power, gives them leverage, and that's why they're successful. Okay, I think we have had all the questions. So we're going to wrap it up. Guys, it was a pleasure again today. And I look forward to the next one, I think, in two weeks from now. Thank you all very much, and see you all next time.